to all the participants for this month's Shanti Shanti Devi Shanti Memorial Shanti Health Shanti Justice, Justice Lecture. Special welcome to our distinguished speaker, Dr. Dr. Inos Masini Nisi, and to our lecture series chair, Prof. Prof. Ramaka. Ramaka. Welcome, welcome everyone. Shanti Devi Memorial Health Justice Lecture Series is a series of online lectures or e-talks exploring intersectoral solutions for specific health problems. Health is an outcome, determinant, and enabler of sustainable development. So do we believe. This lecture is hosted every month, preferably on the second Friday of the month. Without any further ado, let me introduce the chair of Shanti Devi Memorial Health Justice Lecture Series. One of the children of late Mrs. Shanti Devi Shankar, Professor Dr. Rama Khan, continues to remain actively engaged with a range of health and social issues. Professor Ramakant received the WHO Director General's Award in 2005 and has been the former head of surgery department at King George's Medical University and former chief medical superintendent of King George's Medical University as well. In 2012, he was the national president of Association of Surgeons of India. In 2013, he was the vice president of Sark Surgeons and currently he is the president of Lucknow College of Surgeons and principal and dean of GCRG Institute of Medical Sciences and Hospitals. Over to you, Professor Ramakant. Thank you, Madam Prabhu. Welcome, so, friends, to another episode of Shanti Devi Memorial Health Justice Lecture Series. Before we share more about the invited guest speaker who will deliver this month's lecture, let me share briefly and pay tribute to my mother late Mrs. Shanti Devi Shankada, in whose memory this lecture instituted. Mrs. Shanti Devi Shankada was born in rural parts of Uttar Pradesh in India, and despite odds and challenges of social and economic inequalities, fueled by gender disparity, she not only boldly confronted these stereotypes, but also lived her life upholding values and having a life influencing impact on others. She passed away on 21st December 2006. Shanti Devi Memorial Health Justice Lecture Series feature noted health experts from around the world who have devotedly worked on specific health issues and interlinkages within the health sector as well as between the health and non-health sectors. The focus of each lecture is to explore solutions that require intersectoral collaboration for improving specific program outcomes. This month's lecture will be delivered by a person who was instrumental in rolling out the first ever child-friendly TB medicines globally. Dr. Enos Mazzini, a senior TB advisor at the World Health Organization country office in Kenya, is a former head of Kenyan government's national TB program. Under his leadership, Kenya successfully rolled out the child-friendly TB medicines last year. Friends, it is surprising unbelievable to, to some extent that the world forgot the children when it comes to TB till very recently when a lot of action has been taken place on, on childhood TB. If we took back before 2010, there was hardly any data on childhood TB. In other diseases, we find that the different type of combinations are available which are tailor-made for the children. But in tuberculosis, this was ignored. Diagnosing TB in children has been more challenging compared to diagnosing TB in adults. Even traditional ways of collecting sputum samples will not work. There are new diagnostic tools and we do hope that every child who has TB gets diagnosed early without delay. TB treatment was not tailor-made for children. I remember way bands of TB medicines in our respiratory medicine clinics at Gandhi Memorial and Associated Hospitals, Lucknow, where I was the chief medical superintendent more than a decade back. It is heartening to learn that finally, after a very long wait, first ever child-friendly TB medicine were launched in December 2015. Despite Dr. Mezzanine's leadership at the National TB Program of Kenya, back then and commitment of Kenyan government to roll out first ever child-friendly TB medicine, it took them several months to begin the rollout. After more than 1.5 years of the launch, friends, remaining countries are yet to roll out these child-friendly TB medicines. We need intersectoral partnerships to accelerate the process of translating scientific achievements into the public health gains without delay. 
Also, we must remember children getting TB from adults. So do not forget infection control policies and the methods. Latest data released by RNTCP two weeks ago, 76,000 children tested for TB in major cities across India. Out of these, 5,500 had positive active TB disease. Out of 5,500 who had active TB disease, 9% were MDR TB. And first time, gene expert was used to test each of these 76,000 children across India. All children with MDR TB, 9% of those with confirmed TB disease had con contracted MDR person to person transmission route. None of these children were earlier exposed to ATT, that means antitubular treatment, and underlying failure on infection control. This is a very serious situation. Now, RNTCP is expanding testing of children by gene expert to other cities too for intensified case finding. Every case of TB and also MDR can be prevented if infection control counseling and systems were in place in all health care settings, communities, buses, trains, public places, and homes. If parents and families knew how can their own disease can put their own children at risk and what can they do pre to prevent this? Example, one example, open window, for example. Thank you, Dr. Mazini, for accepting to deliver this talk. We are obliged. We do look forward to your insights. And over to you now, Dr. Mazini. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, the organizers and everyone who has joined in. Uh, warm greetings, everyone from Nairobi, Kenya. It's um, a sunny and beautiful afternoon uh, here. And it's it, it's my pleasure to uh, share this presentation that is on engaging health and um, health sectors to increase access to child TB medicines in Kenya, but also just to spur other countries to take up this initiative and ensure that the children who have TB have access uh, to these uh, medicines. My name is Enos Massini. I work at the World Health Organization and I've previously worked for the Ministry of Health at the National TB Program. I think it's clear that the new reality is that ending TB as a public health challenge cannot be accomplished by the NTPs alone. It requires building broad partnerships and engagement across government ministries, collaboration with civil society organizations, uh, patient organization, community-based organizations, public and private sector providers, uh, and other health providers. And the reason is that we require to provide a mix of health and non-health interventions. And therefore, we require a broad level of partners to be able that these interventions can be provided in an optimal manner. We all remain cognizant of the challenges that we face globally and even here in Kenya uh, in um, providing optimal childhood TB care and prevention. And these challenges are misdiagnosis for children who have TB, TB medicines that are not child friendly and that lead to poor health and poor outcomes or drug resistance, but also serious gaps in collabor collaboration between the national TB programs and other sectors, both within government like maternal and child health, HIV programs, community healthcare workers, civil society, that lead to missed opportunities in diagnosis, but also lead to missed opportunities in prevention and also lead to delivery of suboptimal care. This presentation, I will attempt to document the engagement Kenya undertook to tackle the second challenge, that's providing a TB treatment that is child friendly, but also looks at how introduction of child TB friendly medicines can be used as an opportunity to mitigate the first and the second challenges, which is uh, missed opportunities for diagnosis in children, and also increasing opportunities for collaboration across sectors. We are all aware of the challenges that we faced with the old childhood TB treatment, providing incorrect doses because the drugs had to be, the pills had to be broken, crushed, and they were, and the test was not so good. The new childhood TB medicines provide us an opportunity to provide the correct doses because they are dissolvable in water, and they test good, 
it makes it easier for the health system to procure and to supply, but it also makes it easier for the healthcare workers and the caregivers to provide this medicine to the children. In fact, the children look forward to having their, their dose, their daily dose of these drugs, unlike the previous uh, TB medicine. So there is all the justification for us to put in our efforts and ensure that all children with tuberculosis access this child TB friendly medicine. In Kenya, we saw the introduction of child friendly medicine as an opportunity to concomitantly engage and implement other TB prevention and care activities, both within the health facility and in the community. Within the health facility, it provides us an opportunity to do engage, engagement with diverse healthcare workers in terms of training them and ensuring that uh, childhood TB services are optimized in maternal child health clinic, in children inpatient and outpatient services, and in nutrition clinic. In the community, it provided an opportunity to engage uh, civil society, community-based organization, and other key players in strengthening community awareness for childhood TB, but also in, in conducting contact tracing for TB diagnosis, but also for prevention for providing isoniazid preventive therapy. But it also provided us an opportunity to engage other sectors, like the Ministry of Education, in provision of uh, optimal response for TB within the health sector. The rollout planning for child TB medicines in Kenya commenced in December 2015. Uh, I think barely about three or so weeks after the Union Conference in Cape Town, South Africa, where the World Health Organization, uh, UNITAID, and TB Alliance launched these formulations. This rollout planning culminated into the availability of these drugs in October 2016, making Kenya the first country in the world to avail the medicines on a national scale. To do this, the National TB Program had to involve a coordination team that had to look at various facets of the rollout. It also had to do revision of the TB guidelines to incorporate the child TB friendly medicine. In execution of its coordination and leadership role, the NTP formed a multi-partner and multidisciplinary national coordination team that was led by the child TB focal person. This team included partners like the World Health Organization, USID, CDC, UNICEF. It included NGOs and civil society organizations like Management Sciences of Health, Stop TB Partnership Kenya, Center for Health Solution, TB Advocacy and Consortium, and CANCO, just to mention a few. It also included public sector players like the University of Nairobi, the Ministry of Education, and the Maternal Child Health Department. The Kenya Association of Prevention of Tuberculosis and Lung Diseases represented the private health sector provider, providers in this coordination team. The team also included the Child TB Technical Working Group. It included communication and advocacy experts, uh, procurement and supply chain management experts, and also the Global Fund Unit at National TB Program. The procurement uh, was supported by a Global Fund. And the process of bringing the commodities in the country, we, uh, an approval had to be sought from the relevant regulatory authority, which is the Kenya Pharmacy and Poisons Board. Forecasting and quantification was done for the old TB medicine versus the current child TB friendly medicines in December 2015, which resulted into development of a phase out plan of the old medicine and a phase in plan for the new child TB medicine. And this led to development of, an of a procurement plan that was initiated in, in, in January 2016. Engagement had to be done across various sectors, both the national and subnational level. Sensitization meetings on the new child friendly TB uh, formulations was done at the national level and the county level to inform and engage stakeholders on the rollout. 
but also seek other opportunities for collaboration and acceleration of child TB agenda. These four us uh, included uh, involved county health managers, pediatricians, frontline healthcare workers, including those from maternal and child health set, uh, settings, health implementing partners, members of civil society. The partnership also was formed to provide support for development of information, education, and communication material that you can see on your screen that were used for raising awareness on childhood TB, creating demand for child TB medicine and for patient education. And we are grateful for uh, partners like the TB Alliance, UNITAID, UNICEF, and Center for Health Solutions for the roles that they played in, in supporting the program, both technical support and financial support to ensure that these uh, information, education, and communication materials become a reality. Further, this partnership ensured and supported the country to develop pamphlets and infographics and audiovisual audio aids that targeted healthcare workers to ensure that they increase diagnosis of TB in children. And I think you can see these on, on, on the screen. In the build-up to the national rollout of the child-friendly TB medicine, the local and international media were engaged to document the challenges of using the old TB medicine. The wide media coverage demonstrated to the public why child-friendly TB medicines were urgently needed to ensure that no child dies of TB. After the rollout, local and international media remained engaged to document the rollout process and the uptake of the medicines. Radio spots were aired across various local stations on signs and symptoms of TB in children and the availability of child-friendly TB medicine. I might say that the media was really engaged and really interested in, in this process. We also engaged a local comedian and a renowned media personality called Churchill as a goodwill ambassador for childhood TB. Among other things that was done with uh, Churchill was uh, enabling access to over 2.5 million of his social media followers with childhood TB messages. But the NTP uh, looks forward again to further engage Churchill to be able to use the fora that he, he has to avail child TB prevention and care messages to children across Kenya. One of the add-on objectives for the rollout of childhood TB medicine was a campaign to use children as agents of change. That means using school children to pass on knowledge they have learned on, about TB in schools to their households and communities. Further to these, over 130,000 children received health talks on TB and applied that knowledge to develop essays and artwork on how they can champion the fight against TB. And this slide just, just basically shows you some of the, of the essays and writings that these children did. To formalize the collaboration and facilitate an effective and efficient response from the education sector on TB prevention and care, the Ministry of Health has initiated an engagement with the Ministry of Education at policy level. This is ongoing and will, among other things, ensure that the school health curriculum has the most updated information on TB, but also use schools as opportunities for screening for, 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 for tuberculosis and spreading the message about tuberculosis. A significant number of TB patients in Kenya initiate care in the private health sector. Engagement was made with the Kenya Association for the Prevention of Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, called CAPTLD, a partner organization that supports TB prevention and care in the private sector. Through this engagement, it ensured that the private sector has also access to the child-friendly TB medicines. For the faith-based providers and other voluntary best health providers, direct supplies of these child-friendly medicines were received directly from the National TB Program. Ladies and gentlemen, courtesy of these wide multi-sectoral engagements, over 6,000 children in Kenya 
have been initiated on child-friendly TB medicines in the last nine or so months. But also, the launch of child TB-friendly medicines has acted as a catalyst and has actually accelerated the childhood TB agenda in, in Kenya. And the Ministry of Health and the NTP looks forward to further engage the sectors like the Ministry of Education, the civil society, patient organization, and other sectors to ensure that, that prevention and care for childhood TB is prioritized and we bridge the missing gap of children who have tuberculosis who remained undiagnosed and treated. Lastly, ladies and gentlemen, I want to provide a special thank you to the current NTP manager in Kenya, Dr. Maureen Kamene, the childhood TB focal person, Dr. Immaculate Kadure, and uh, the Dr. Teresia Njoroge, the childhood TB advisor, both of who did a lot of work to ensure that this rollout becomes a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mesni. It was a very nice and very informative and uh, we are all surprised that uh, how could this uh, phenomena happen because uh, it was very much required for children to have a proper dose and this is the reason for development of the MDR and uh, your ideas which are here I'm sure will be utilized and uh, intersectoral collaboration which you have suggested must be done and awareness programs and those things will be taken up I'm sure about it and really I express my great regards and thank you very much for taking this nice lecture. Thank you very much. We now open for a discussion session. Participants, please be welcome to give your comments, remarks, or share your experience, ask questions, or get clarifications, if any, from our respected speaker. Please use the chat function to type in your comments or raise the virtual hand you see on your screen to speak. I would first like to invite Evelyn Kibuchi who is with us here today. She is the National Coordinator of Top TV Partnership Kenya to share her insight on how to accelerate rollout child-friendly TB medicines as well as how to forge effective partnerships. Over to you, Evelyn. Thank you very much, uh, all the speakers, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. I think the first thing for uh, for, for rolling out is uh, for countries to understand that to, to make demand <coughs> sorry <coughs> and for them to make demand the communities have to be involved they have to be involved to know that uh, there is a new product in the in the, in the offing and uh, for them to understand how it's going to transform um, the response to TB in their countries secondly uh, countries have to review their policies to make sure that uh, the policies are friendly to receive um, the, the new product and most important they have to be sure of where they're going to get funding if the funding is coming from the government then they need to ensure that they work with the national government to ensure that uh, the budget lines for supporting the rollout has been factored in in their national budget and if uh, the funding is going to come from uh, external donors then it's good for them to know at what point they're going to put uh, that proposal they're going to they're going to make the request to the national government to their donors on the at the country level uh, like dr. Massini has clearly put uh, put it out uh, it is almost impossible to work alone it is very good that you work in partnership one with the national government with the Ministry of Health with the civil society with the media and um, even with the affected communities because at the end of the day they are the ones who are going to create uh, demand and also the healthcare workers who are the, the ones who actually administer that uh, the new product they need to be sensitized they need to be trained they need to be informed so that partnership, that partnership of all those stakeholders in the country need to be involved for a successful rollout. Thank you, Evelyn. Participants, please keep on sending your questions. You can use the chat function 
to type in or raise your virtual hand to see which you see on your screen to speak. Meanwhile, we have a question from Zafar Kidwai of Bangladesh. Zafar is saying, it is good to learn that Kenya engaged the Ministry of Education in TB control. He wants to know if it reduced TB stigma in the education sector and sensitized education workers on TB prevention and TB care. Dr. Masini, would you like to say something? I think, thank you for that question. And um, let me state that the, the engagement is, is ongoing. Um, the launch of the childhood TB medicine provided that catalyst to have an engagement with the Ministry of Education and with schools so that we can have an adequate uh, response for TB prevention and care from the education sector. That would include uh, policy formulation, um, uh, development of curriculum and all that. So it's a process that we look for that 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 the ministry looks forward to take forward with the ministry of of education that will ensure that uh, this is achieved. So we may not be able at this stage to say if stigma is reduced or this has happened, but we look forward to uh, favorable outcomes in, uh, in 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 the future. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Nolin of Philippines. Uh, Nolin, thanks, Dr. Masini. Uh, says that it is good to know that private sector was engaged via the Kenya Association for the Prevention of TB and Lung Disease. Are private doctors notifying TB and childhood TB in Kenya and is NTP regulating therapies provided in the private sector? Uh, thank you, thank you. I think we cannot underst uh, understand the importance of involvement of the private sector. And by private sector, I mean it's the whole breadth of the private sector from the informal providers to the formal providers. Kenya has a robust engagement with, with the formal health providers, the hospitals, um, the registered clinics. And most of this engagement is either done directly by the National TB program or through partnership with the CAP TLD, which I mentioned earlier, uh, that supports uh, TB prevention and care activities in the private sector. So the engagement is ongoing, and there are still gaps and which have to be worked on to ensure that we bring all the healthcare, all the private healthcare providers within fold. But also just to go further and ensure that we bring even other providers like um, uh, chemists, other providers like uh, shops, other providers like pharmacists, other providers like traditional healers, not necessarily for treatment, but in terms of collaborating with the public sector in re screening and referral of both children and adults who are suspected to have the disease. So we have a robust, the country has a robust engagement with the, uh, with the private sector but there's still steps to be undertaken to ensure that that engagement is optimized, especially with the informal uh, private sector. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Shailesh or from India. Shailesh, would you like to ask your question? Yes, sure. Uh, the, thank you, Dr. Masini. I had a couple of questions. Uh, First was, uh, could you throw some light about on the cost uh, that this medication costs for treating one child? Um, and uh, that's the first question. Uh, secondly, I also wanted to find out what is the overlap uh, between uh, the children uh, who are being treated for TB under this program and those children who are having uh, who are living with HIV. Is there been have you found that uh, there are large number of, there are a good number of children who are living with HIV have got and then getting treated. Thank you, that's all. Uh, I may please request that they re repeat the question, especially the second one. I didn't, there's a bit of hesitancy in the communication. I didn't get, I did not get the, the question. Uh, sure, uh, okay. I will repeat my question. Okay. Uh, the first question was, could you throw some light on the cost of the treatment per child? And the second question was, uh, what is the rate of children who are getting uh, TB, a childhood TB, uh, uh, the number of children who have HIV, living with HIV, and have TB? Is there an overlap that you have found in Kenya? 
Okay. Am I clear this time? Very clear. Thank you very much. Uh, in terms of in terms of course, I don't have the um, I don't have the data with me, so I'm not able to provide. And uh, probably I could um, uh, find that and share with the um, uh, with the organizers, and then they can uh, share with you or widely. But this is data I think that can be found um, even uh, um, under the Stop TB partnership and WHO can be. But I'll I'll endeavour to provide that. In terms of uh, TB HIV co-infection. Uh, among children in this country, in, in, in Kenya, it's it's about 30% uh, of the children who have TB are co-infected with, with, with HIV. And um, I think the key thing to say is that uh, Kenya has made a lot of progress in providing TB HIV, co uh, TB -HIV um, services. And it's able to provide uh, both the screening and testing and then being able to provide both the treatment for TB and HIV and ma making sure that the outcomes are, are, are adequate, but also providing um, isoniazid preventive therapy for the, both the children and the adults who probably um, are at a higher risk, are HIV infected and at a high, higher risk of developing tuberculosis. Uh, thank you. We have a question from Dr. Manoj Toshniwal. Uh, from India. Uh, he wants to know uh, whether the rollout of the new child-friendly formulations was with domestic budgetary resources or with the help of some international grant? The, the funding was derived from a global fund and um, so and it was not a new funding stream really, it's just replacing what we would have used to purchase the older formulations with. Uh, but it's significant also to note that in Kenya, um, in terms of TB commodities, close to 50% of the TB drugs and medicines are actually purchased by domestic financing. Then uh, the rest are, are purchased by e external funding, and which in this case is global fund. But for the, specifically for the childhood TB medicine, it was through a uh, global fund. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Lindsay McKenna, thanking Dr. Massini and congratulating him on this excellent work. Lindsay wants to know how many children have been treated in TB in Kenya since the new formulations were launched. Uh, I think I want to say that I think Dr. Massini mentioned 6,000 uh, children on the new medication, as much as I remember from his talk. Uh, Lindsay, also, Lindsay also wants to know how many children are still receiving the old pediatric formulations and what does the timeline look like for full transition to the new child-friendly medication? For the second part of the question, the full transition has already been achieved. Um, the, the overlap was only between uh, October and February, uh, about October to February, October 2016 to February 2017. So all the newly and all the newly enrolled children from 1st of October 2016 were started on childhood TB medicine, while the ones who are continuing at that was by, by that date continued with the old formulation. So we are in full transition, we are in uh, fully under the new uh, formulations. But for, for purposes of countries, of course, you have to develop um, a phase out and phase in plan, and there will always be an overlap between those. So it's decisions that really have to be made uh, bearing in mind the country context. You can either decide to do some parts of the country while you are doing the old formulations on the other parts, but that will really has to be a country decision. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Massini, I would like to know if uh, you, you, Kenya faced some problems at the ground level while rolling out these new child-friendly formulations. Uh, for example, what comes to my mind is that these are dissolvable tablets, so they have to be dissolved in water. Uh, how much water to use, what type of water to use. Uh, did you face these problems when the rollout began? Uh, yes, and um, we, 
anticipated that we would face these problems and um, I think the NTP adequately planned for them and this included um, sensitization and training of the healthcare workers on, on, on the processes, dissolving how much water is required and all that. So this, the, the sensitization process actually involved real practical sessions and to reach up, to reach all the healthcare providers that, that, that would be involved. So you have to um, um, ensure that you actually capacity build the healthcare workers way before the actual um, rollout begins so that they know exactly what uh, to do. Thank you. Uh, Peter Robiti wants to know if there are plans for county rollout as media coverage does not reach rural areas and hard to reach areas. So how do we raise awareness in county areas about these new medicines? Uh, thank you, thank you. I appreciate the question from Peter Witty, and I appreciate is 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 very passionate about um, about the community-based TB activities, and uh, I agree with him that there are still gaps in uh, raising awareness at at the community level about TB in general, the signs and symptoms, how to, when to seek care for it, uh, how to ensure that you are compliant with medicine. So. These gaps really have to be to be to be resolved, and uh, I'm sure the National TB Program is currently working to ensure that uh, um, adequate support is provided to the community-based organization, and the civil society, to play this role. Because the best organization to play this role will be the organizations that are best at the community, and therefore well understand well understand the needs and aspirations of, of, of the community. Thank you. Uh, participants, I repeat, please use the chat function to type in your comments or questions or raise the virtual hand you see on your screen to speak. Uh, Dr. Nimmer from Damien Foundation Belgium wants to know uh, if Kenya has evaluated the adherence to treatment with the child-friendly formulations as compared with the old formulations. Has there oh, been an improvement? Not yet, but very good suggestion. So I think the, the, the National TB program and its partners will, will highly consider that. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Archana Trivedi from the Union in Delhi. Uh, Archana wants to know if diagnosing childhood TB was challenging to start medication in Kenya. Please. The diagnosing part of uh, Please go Hello. over the question again. I didn't quite get yes. the question. She wants to know if diagnosing childhood TB was a challenge to start medication in Kenya. Diagnosing of childhood TB poses challenge and leads to missed opportunities for identifying the children who have the disease, not only in Kenya, but globally. So the challenge here would be is that not all children with tuberculosis eventually get to be diagnosed. And therefore, all children who require treatment don't end up being put on treatment. And probably the number that we've put on treatment may represent not the full number of children who actually should have been on, 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 on treatment. And really lots of work have, has to be done in the area of, of childhood TB globally to be able to ensure that we eliminate the, the, diagnosing, the diagnosis gap that uh, e exists. Thank you. Uh, Dr. P.S. Sarma, a senior TB expert from India and part of the core organizing team of NatCon 2017, wants to ask a question. Uh, Dr. Sarma, would you like to ask? The government of the government of India has made TB a notifiable disease. Is it so in Kenya? Uh, thank you, Dr. Sarma. And uh, I really appreciate the work that has gone on in India. After that, was uh, TB was made a notifiable disease. I take note that the case notification in India uh, drastically uh, increased. Um, TB is a notifiable disease in Kenya, 
and um, uh, all health providers are um, obligated to uh, notify the National TB program or the Ministry of Health of all cases of tuberculosis that they have diagnosed and put on treatment. But of course, in actual practice, as elsewhere else, there would be there would be gaps in terms of um, in in terms of the numbers notified. Do they reflect the actual numbers that were diagnosed? Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Samuel Misoi from Kenya wants to make a comment. Samuel, would you like to make that comment yourself? Can I make my comments? Okay. Yes. I was saying, having been part of the team that uh, actually worked on the rollout of this child friendly medicine, what the lesson, one lesson I learned was the teamwork and collaboration with other partners was the key to the success. And I want to commend all the other countries who are going to start to look into the areas of collaborating with other stakeholders if they want to roll out the child-friendly medicine. Thank you. I mean, I couldn't agree with Samuel more. I mean, he headed the communication and advocacy um, team, uh, sub-team in, in, in the whole component. And the key thing is about partnership, partnership and multi-stakeholder and teamwork, that everyone uh, brings something crucial on the table that will move the agenda forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We have a similar comment from uh, Roger pa uh, Paul Kamagusha, Editor-in-Chief of the Health Times Africa, Uganda. Roger says, the synergy of health and non-health non sectors is key in strategy shift. We cannot keep doing the same thing in TB while expecting different results. Kudos to Kenya and to Dr. Massini. So, Dr. Massini deserves a clap for that. <laughs> Th th thank you. And I couldn't agree with Rogers more uh, that the, the biggest challenge in TB control right now is actually the lack of multi-sectoral engagement. Probably something that has been done fair, fairly well by HIV to bring in other uh, partners that will broaden the response beyond the biomedical um, response. I think the biomedical response can only get us as far as we are to get the missing cases we need to bring on all other sectors. And I think that's why I think at the start of this meeting, at the start of this session, um, there was reference to the meeting that will be held in Moscow later this year, organized by the WHO, to bring together um, high level representation from uh, countries to be able to spearhead multi-sectoral engagement. And multi-sectoral engagement, I don't think can be done by the national TB programs. It requires much higher. It would require Ministry of Health and other partners to be able to spearhead that process. Thank you. Uh, journalist Victor Motori uh, wants to ask a question. Victor, would uh, you like to ask? Yes, yes. My name is Victor Motori from Kenya, and I'm happy to hear uh, Evan Kibuchi and Misoi talking. And uh, maybe uh, what I can say is that uh, actually Kenya has uh, really tried to fight TB in Kenya by seeing changes, uh, children are getting drugs and so forth. Maybe a question uh, I may ask is that uh, why is it uh, hard uh, to get, to get uh, experts, uh, especially on MDR and XDR for interview? Because uh, currently there's a, uh, there's a story I'm doing about uh, MDR TB and uh, until now uh, I haven't found any uh, doctor to interview. That's my question. Maybe to Evelyn Kebuchi and uh, Dr. Massimi. All right. Um, I think um, the National TB program has many experts on uh, on multi-drug resistant TB, and um, and they they should be able to provide them to you. I think uh, you can get in touch, and so that we can facilitate that, or Evelyn Kebuchi can be able to facilitate um, you getting in touch with the National TB program. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Brespati Kumar Pandey from India. He wants to know uh, the status of MDRTB in children and uh, what strategies are being used uh, for treatment of children with MDRTB and how uh, serious or difficult is the problem of MDRTB in children. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, let me confess I'm not an, um, an expert in MDR-TB. Uh, uh, so I'll speak from Kenya experience, uh, is that we have uh, identified and reported several cases of children who have uh, drug-resistant TB, and mostly is through uh, infection from uh, close contacts, either their parents or their caregivers who have uh, the disease. The challenge is, like even with with the with other drugs susceptible ordinary TB, is in terms of of, of diagnosis and confirming diagnosis uh, in 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 the children. But also the challenge is that the drugs for drug resistant TB are fairly toxic, but also they are not child friendly. So probably that's another area where um, we require a lot of in, in innovations to ensure that we avail child-friendly medicines for children with drug-resistant TB. So they have, the tablets have to be crushed, the tablets have to be split, and the, with tablets that are test awful and are unpalatable, the experience is not there for uh, extremely good for, for children who get drug-resistant TB. But uh, treatment is ongoing even in this country uh, for drug-resistant TB amongst children. Thank you. Uh, and that uh, makes me ask a question, uh, Dr. Massini, that uh, since Kenya has been a trailblazer uh, in uh, uh, trying to control childhood TB by uh, starting these, uh, dispensing these new child-friendly formulations, uh, what efforts are being made on the infection control front to eventually reduce the number of children who really need any drugs, that is to reduce the number of children with TB. Actually, a scenario would, the best scenario would be no child needs TB drugs, no child has TB. So infection control is an important part of that and what efforts are being made in that direction? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, children get TB disease from adults and when a child is diagnosed with TB disease, it means there is an adult in the community who has the disease and who has spread the disease to them. So control of TB in children will involve ensuring that the adult TB is controlled. That means people are promptly diagnosed and put on treatment. That will ensure that they do not spread it to um, the, their children or the children that they are in contact with. Secondly, prevention measures are available for children. When children are contacts of adults who have uh, a TB disease, they are supposed to be screened for tuberculosis. And if they screen negative, then they should be put on a preventive therapy to prevent them from developing the disease. Further on, within healthcare settings and within congregate settings like schools, adequate um, prevention, infection prevention measures have to be put in place. So one of them is to ensure that in health facilities, um, there's no delay in diagnosing of patients who visit the health facilities and patients are promptly put on treatment. There is triage, there's adequate ventilation, there is um, protection using masks, and, and, and such. And Samuel Misoy, I think, who talked earlier, is an expert in, in this area. So it's actually a, a combination of, of various factors to ensure that there is prevention of, of childhood TB. But of course, um, of course, there's even uh, vaccination. And the current vaccine that we know, BCG, that is available, uh, prevents severe forms of, of, of child, uh, childhood TB, like TB meningitis. Thank you. Thank you. And this reminds me of an incident about two years ago. In fact, I met a child, uh, rather a baby in Delhi, nine months old, diagnosed with MDR-TB. And there was no TB in the family, neither in the near neighborhood. So, the, and the child was too small, like not going to school or not really moving out, but must have con contracted it from somewhere in the community, a nine-month-old child. She was treated successfully for it, 
But uh, it's really scary to think that that was a direct transmission case and there would be many such cases. A nine-month-old child with MDRT. I, I uh, think you're absolutely correct. And the message here is that if we control tuberculosis in the community and we therefore are able to have a bigger foothold in controlling childhood TB because it's a sentinel disease. Yes. Uh, thank you. We have a question from Dr. Rumonyu. Uh, wants to know, does the preliminary program data from Kenya show better cure rates on using the new child-friendly drugs? Is there any data on that? I currently do not have data of the cohorts of, um, of children who have completed treatment to be able to compare. Um, you know, the, I think the first cohorts of children who finished treatment must have completed sometime probably in April or so. So that analysis is going on and we should, it should be, uh, be able to be documented and to be, to be available. But I appreciate the question from uh, Dr. Rumuni. We should therefore expect uh, better treatment outcomes because, uh, I mean, these are easier to take. They are fruit flavored. Uh, the ch child looks forward to providing them. The caregiver is, um, also looks forward to giving them. These commodities also have less stock out at the health facility level because they are fixed dose formulation compared to the older formulations. But we'll provide, uh, the country will provide information on that as is available. Thank you, but uh, I think we do hope that definitely adherence would have improved. Uh, and Correct. so, and if it's better adherence, then better treatment outcomes as well. So that, That's true, that better adherence should lead to, to better outcomes. And yes. um, yeah, true. Thank you. We have a question from Catherine, a journalist, journalist from Zimbabwe. Uh, maybe more of a rhetoric question. Uh, she says child-friendly formulations are taking forever to be introduced in so many countries. We celebrated their launch in December 2015, and but countries like Zimbabwe are still delaying as minors continue to die of TB. So when will the countries wake up to the need of putting in these friendly formulations on board? I think that's a challenge to all of us across the whole world to, to ensure that we accelerate access to, to the new innovations that become available. Not only things like new friendly medicines, new child friendly medicines, but even access to things like uh, using GeneXpert for diagnosing of, of, of TB in children and using the shorter multi-drug resistant TB uh, treatment uh, regimens. It's a challenge and we have to advocate and uh, push the people concerned to be able to prioritize it. it has Kenya started on the shorter MDR-TB regimen? Is, the, is there some plan to start that in Kenya? Yeah, the plans are to start uh, in the latter half of this year. So in the next couple of months or so, because um, all the preparations have already been made in terms of um, of, of um, there's ongoing training of healthcare workers on use. There's uh, the laboratories have already been prepared uh, to to be able to support the rollout of the shorter MDRTB uh, treatment. And also, I'm aware that um, um, that the commodities are within procurement, so that should be able to be done within the year. That, that's great news. Uh, Evelyn has her hand raised. Evelyn, you would like to ask ask or say something? Yes, I have a comment or maybe a question to Dr. Masini. Dr. Masini, thank you so much for your leadership in rolling out, in assisting the country to roll out the child-friendly medicine. My question is, um, Kenya is such a strategic country within the East African region, and uh, there's a lot of cross-border uh, interaction between our neighbors, that is uh, Somali, Sudan, and you know, and the rest, and the East African, East African countries. Are there any plans? Have there been any plans, probably, to influence the countries that are neighboring us to also roll out 
the child friendly? Has there been any interaction of such nature? Thank, thank you, Evelyn, and um, I also appreciate the role that you played uh, with other colleagues from the civil society in supporting the NTP and its partners to ensure rollout of the child-friendly TB medicine. Uh, <laughs> an interesting question. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. Uh, but uh, um, I would probably put the challenge to you that uh, Stop TB Partnership Kenya, I know you you, you have uh, colleagues of Stop TB Partnership Uganda, you have parliamentarians who you are affiliated with under the African TB caucus in Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda. I think this is a, a good area for advocacy and you would be the right people to drive this agenda forward. Thank you, Dr. Masini. Rehana, a journalist from Bangladesh, uh, has to say, uh, that this is a very important topic as it is so difficult to feed any medicine to a child. But user-friendly medicines should be made available for everyone. Even adults struggle with toxic medications of TB and at times due to their severe side effects find it very difficult to adhere to therapy. When will we have shorter and less or zero toxic treatments for TB in children and adults alike? I think, again, that's a question which all of us are asking. And probably, as uh, Dr. Massini said, that the shorter MDR-TB treatment that is there in the, uh, is being uh, rolled out in countries, and Kenya is also going to roll it out by the end of this year, as he said. Uh, true, true. And um, uh, so I think one of the key things about uh, TB is that for many years, we've not had uh, new drugs uh, being available. Like in the last 40 years, probably the new drugs that have been available is, is this one called bedaculin and the lamanid. And therefore, it means that a lot of uh, research has to be globally prioritized uh, to ensure that we have new drugs available. And those are the ones that will hold the key of having a, a shortened regimen. I know the work that has been going on um, recently, studies that have been done to uh, uh, for availing shorter uh, drug treatment regimens that will last about four months have not actually been very, very successful. So we look forward again to this to be a key area of research. And I'm happy that uh, in, the, in the meeting that was held, I think last week for G20, there was specific mention of tuberculosis. And uh, this will mean probably that um, uh, a lot of financing is availed for research and development, getting newer molecules, and therefore increasing the prospects of, uh, of, 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 of shorter regimens for treatment of, of, of tuberculosis. Thank you. There is a comment from Evelyn Naganga. Uh, uh, she says that development of job aids and reference material on new formulation use and dosage was very helpful for lower level facilities implementation in Kenya. Thank you, Evelyn. Uh, and then we have a comment from uh, Tesfair Basore, the in-country TB advisor to national. Uh, it is a very timely and important lecture. And thanks to CNS and to Dr. Massini for this. We have Thank a comment from yeah. too many claps for you, Dr. Massini, today. We have a comment from Brenda Mongai. Thank you for the presentation for the countries logged on that haven't started the child friendly formulations. What are the key challenges? I guess that's to everyone, and I appreciate the the kind remark from Dr. Brenda Mungai, who also was among of the partners who supported the NTP to achieve this. Okay, thank you. Uh, with this, we come to the end of our lecture series for today. We thank Dr. Inos Massini, whose insightful talk surely inspired us to think differently and in a more integrated manner. Thanks to lecture chair, Professor Ramakant, and to each of the participants. The lecture got streamed on YouTube. Recording, recording and audio, and audio podcast, podcast will be made available to each one of you soon.
we will we will we meet again, again next month of friday 11th of this sgm health justice lecture goodbye and best wishes